but that's the way it should work. Anyway, thank you for joining us. I know you're, are you in London? I am in London. Nice. How is it? It's, you know, it's nice. It's nice there and here. Good. Well, we've Just been at a had... pub with, with uh, friends and family. I, I have brought my hamburger up with me for this oh, webinar. I won't very eat American of you. Yeah. Well, we've been having some great discussions, uh, and we're so excited to have you join the discussion. I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Um, and then we're just going to um, kind of continue our, our discussion of this incredible book that we've been talking about for the, for the past few weeks. I'll start. Um, we have uh, several people who are joining us as attendees. Uh, and the, I should say that the chats are open and Q&A is open. So if, as we're you know, talking amongst the panelists, attendees, send in your questions um, and chat amongst yourselves. We want to see a lot of activity here. I'm Emil Kressel. I'm the Director of Learning and Development for the University of Texas. And this is a campaign that we do a couple times a year. Our first one was The Sword and the Shield um, by Peniel Joseph. And our second book for the summer is this incredible book, Bowl Away by uh, Elizabeth McCracken. And we're super excited to have you here. Um, Gordon, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Gordon. Uh, I'm the Employee Engagement Coordinator for the Facilities Department here on campus. And uh, yeah, I think that's all I got to say. I got we we've been talking about conspiracy theories regarding your book, so we're hoping. Oh, it's true. It's yeah. You. Brianna. Hi, I'm Brianna Duran. I'm the Campus Environmental Center Coordinator for the UT Office of Sustainability. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm Kaneva Smith, and I'm with the Texas Engineering Executive Education Program. We are the professional development and continuing education arm of the Cockrell School of Engineering. Great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. We had an additional panelist uh, for the first two, Karen Chawner, uh, who's the director of um, SWS. It's a, basically the employment relations arm of HR, and she is not able to join us this time because of a personal issue, but she had been a great contributor, um, added a lot of funny um, anecdotes and moments throughout this conversation, so we're sorry she couldn't be here. Um, so I, I, I know that the rest of the panelists are really anxious to ask questions. We have some... Um, some theories that we want to, want to run by you, but if we could just start out, just um, talk to us about how the story came to you. And I know it's kind of uh, a, a common question, but it, this story in particular, I'm so curious about what was the genesis, how it got started, how the story sort of evolved for you. Sure, and it, I mean, it started, it's funny, I'll, I, I'm looking forward to the questions because really often when I write, I think, well, the problem is I, I don't do anything on purpose. Um, and this book more than usually, um, the first thing that I knew was that I wanted to write about Candlepin Bowling. And I, it's actually a function of being in Texas because, um, you know, Texans are really proud of being Texans. And there is a state identity in Texas that is so interesting to me that, um, and that I find wonderful in a time when, uh, oh, maybe, maybe not this, this year, but sort of generally, um, that there's little regionalism left in America, that, that we're watching the same things, chain stores are identical, like the outskirts of every town are different on the, you know, every town is different on the edges, and, Sometimes they're very similar. I I love that idea of regionalism and being like proud to be shaped by places that are very different from other places. Um, and so I I this is the first book that I wrote in its ent entirety when I lived in Texas, and I think it was sort of very shaped by thinking, okay, you know, my joke is always that you know the um, the, the uh, I don't know what state the eyes of Texas are upon you is at the moment at the University of Texas, whether it's anything official anymore um, or whether it's on its, right. its 
happy way out. <laughs> um, but when I first heard that song, I went, oh my God, you know, that yeah. I'm from Massachusetts and like our, we don't have a song like that, but if we did, it would be the eyes of Massachusetts are politely averted. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I started to think about like, oh, so what are the things that make, we you know in New England we are, I, I think I spent a lot of time going, oh, we don't talk about our state or our region yeah. that way. And I'm like, yeah, actually we do. There are a lot of things that we're intensely proud of, things that make no sense to anywhere else. And so, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blathering, but Candlepin Bowling felt like it was so New England. It's something yeah. that still exists that people in other parts of the country don't know about at all. And the first two characters, I, I had this list of names that I had pulled out of my grandfather's genealogies. He, he was a professional genealogist. He was also, strangely, for one semester, a professor of classics at the University of Texas and had an oh, office in the tower as a visitor. And I had these genealogies, which he wrote in the year that he was at UT. Uh -huh. um, and I pulled out all of these weird names from them. And that is, those are the names of most of the characters. Oh, so the wow. first two names I had were Bertha Truitt and Dr. Leviticus Sprague. Um, and for almost all of the characters, they came to being just because I was, I paid it, I, I looked at the names and thought, oh, I wonder who that is. Uh, and I really I sort of bumbled through after that. Well, that answers another one of my questions that I was going to ask later about uh, whether you uh, wrote through the characters or if you were, or you were intentional about it beforehand and thought that you were going to, you know, have these sort of character vignettes through, throughout. But it sounds like it was just more of, of a sort of organic process or iterative process for you. Yeah, it was. And I, I wrote a lot of drafts, mm -hmm. but in the first draft, I really, which it, I think was had a lot of the architecture that of the book that's mm -hmm. there. I didn't know what was going to happen, and right. I was sort of surprised. Right. Okay. So I, I love that. And we had some. Can, sorry. Go ahead, Gordon. Sorry. I was just going to say when when you're writing the book, sometimes like I loved how much. Hey, Gordon. We're ha we're having a little hard hard time hearing you. Could you move closer to your mic? Or. Yeah. Sorry, I'm having some some mic issues today. No, it's I'll good. Talk it's good. louder. Um, so I love how the book just bounces around because that's kind of how my brain works. And I was like, I feel like when she was writing this, she just like had a thought like mid sentence, like I'm going to kill this person. <laughs> like in the next <laughs> sentence, because a lot of the time this, it seems like it's just like, oh, well, they just died. <laughs> well, for me, I mentioned this, I think in the first session that I, I felt like, oh, now I have your MO. What you do is you make me fall in love with the character and then you kill him. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, I, I, I just want to say one other thing about Candlepin, because that's something else I, I tuned into right away is that regionalism. Uh, ne never, at least I don't recall ever hearing about Candlepin bowling. So I had to go online and find out all about it. And then I probably watched about two hours of Candlepin bowling. So um, I love that. And I love discovering that sort of regional essence of, of another place. So that, that's great. But I'll let the other panelists chime in now. Sorry for monopolizing. I guess to, to my like point is like, is that how you decided to kill people off? Or did you know that like this person is gonna die at some point in this story? Yeah, about 50-50 um, <laughs> in that one of the things that I thought about a lot when I was reading it from the beginning was when I was a kid, I loved those books, um, the book of lists and the people's almanac. There's yeah. these weird, um, I mean, they were big in the 70s uh, and 80s when I was a kid. And there'd be things like, you know, seven surprising deaths from history. Uh, and I did early on sort of think, yeah, I want to write about some weird deaths. And there were two things that I had always wanted to put into fiction that I feel like my whole life I've been trying to fit in. And one was spontaneous human comb combustion, uh -huh. which is really big in the book of lists. Uh -huh. And the other was... The Boston molasses flood, which Boston is, flood. I've I've had people say to me both like, "Wow, you invented a whole kind of bowling," and I'm like, "No, that is actual." <laughs> and then I've had other people say, "I couldn't, can't believe you came up with this 
molasses flood. And I, it, I, it always both makes me happy and sort of disappoints me that I didn't invent it, but it's a historical <laughs> event that I've always, which is quite how it's portrayed in, in, in the book. Um, giant tank burst and uh, drowned a lot of people in molasses. Um, and I keep, it's one of those things I keep indulgently trying to cram in. Uh, and it is absolutely true that I was writing the book and I sort of went, oh, what year is it in this book? Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Perfect. I wow. killed somebody. And then I was like, yeah, actually, weirdly, it makes sense to kill the main character. And I probably realized it and did it and wrote that scene in the same day. Um, and I think probably if I had spent time, some time thinking about, is it really sensible to kill your main character simply because the year is 1919 and you want to kill somebody with molasses. Um, so I did it. And then afterwards it did make sense to me because, because my grandfather wrote these genealogies and I was really interested in these giant lists of families. And then, you know, you know when people are going to die in genealogies and people are so obsessed with like how this generation of people leads to this kind of generation. And it always, well, my grandfather, but it always seems sort of strange and wrongheaded, the huge meaning that people attribute to genealogies. Um, and so that, it felt, it felt all right to, to kill off, to kill off people in that way. Was so, it strategic about the method those individuals or characters passed away in the sense that Bertha died in this method and you know Leviticus died in this method. Was it thought behind that or just, I need to use this, this character is gonna take it? Well, I think <laughs> that it was something that they just, there's, by the way, the other, the, a death that happened during my childhood that was a big deal in Boston is somebody getting beat to death with a bowling club, um, a pin in a bowling wow. alley. So I did, mm. you know, I did go, that. oh yeah, that's great. I kill somebody that way. That sounds okay. good. I've thought <laughs> that for a lot of decades. Um, but I, I had, because I had this idea, at one point the book was going to be called, and this is a terrible title, uh, but The Extraordinary Deaths of Ordinary People. And I really had sort of thought of these strange and dramatic deaths um, as markers through the book. And so to some extent it, it was shaped by the fact that I had to kill somebody off by 1919. And then, I mean, it's really grim. Everybody else's deaths fell into place because I knew, I was interested, I get sort of in how dramatic deaths can, can occasionally both make a person noticeable and erase the person at the same time. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, how, that's how it happened. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think what he's getting at too, Nan, is, is we, we had this conversation in, in one of our past um, kind of discussions that it seems like a, a chicken egg kind of thing. Like, did you create the, the characteristics of Leviticus being afraid of fire first, or did you know you were going to kill him with fire? So then you made him afraid of fire. And then we talked about the the kind of stark difference of how Bertha is this loud, outgoing, you know, she talks kind of fast and she dies in like the most like slow, ridiculous way that seems like if anything was going to kill her. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's such a good question because I think, I mean, I'm going to repeat that there's a lot that I don't do on purpose as a writer. And I didn't mean that sort of like, oh, I don't know. The characters just, you know, they, I listen to them. Cause that's not it. It's when, I, when I'm trying to write about a fictional character I try to start from a place of deep sympathy and understanding of that character even if I don't necessarily know their whole biography at the time. And that the only way that I know to write about characters is to sort of understand them from the inside in some way. And, um, and then go out and find out, you know, let them sort of radiate out and find out details about their biography. And that if I ever try to write a character by knowing a lot of biographical details and having it sort of rain down on 
on the character, then they're just sort of like a pile of quirks yeah. with no humanity underneath. So that doesn't really answer your question, except for, I guess, you know, I, I, I try to, I, yeah, I try to understand the characters and then maybe my, my the, the, the meanest, cruelest part of my subconscious went, yeah, that would be a good way to kill that character. Well, I want to make two points here, uh, and then I want to hear about Brianna's theory because um, that that one's I'm really curious about it. But the one is it's really interesting for me to hear you talk about genealogy because I think that I I, I see that in the story where a couple of times you sort of jump ahead and, and you reveal that a certain character dies much later than the timeline. I thought, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Like, you're not supposed to let us know. But of course, everybody dies. And so it does feel like a, a genealogical history. So that's really interesting. My other um, point I want to hear about, hear from you about is you talk about um, sympathy, showing or understanding or feeling some sympathy for characters. And all the characters I feel are, you have a lot of sympathy for them. They're all flawed. Uh, they all, I, however, are very likable, uh, save one, mm -hmm. at least in my mind. But I'd like to, I, I'm not, I don't know if that's just me, but uh, Nahum Truett is beyond redemption in my mind. Is he, is he with you as well or no? Um, yes, he is. Um, and any sort of softening of that character at all is a little later on because he was such a... Right just an utter villain so the, the idea that like you know he loves his wife i didn't mean that to to, to make him sympathetic but yeah. he was he was a he was such a villain in the early drafts so yes okay brianna no let's hear it that. he's my favorite character i mean I love <laughs> how dare you but yeah how <laughs> dare you yeah so what i'm most curious about like that opening scene like Within minutes, the very first thing I thought of was the story of Rip Van Winkle mm -hmm. um, with the bowling and waking up, you know, it felt like she fell out of time in that way. So I'm just curious, was that an inspiration or is that just like pure coincidence? Um, well, I can't call it pure coincidence because I have read Rip Van Winkle and, you know, he that's the, the first mention of bowling in American literature is from that. I also like the fact that, um, uh, that uh, Washington Irving also is the first reference to donuts in the in literature appears, right. and I can't remember in what what he, what he wrote. Um, and so I must have been thinking about that because that was one of the. I can't remember how the book used to open, but the opening was one of the last things that I wrote because I kept having a hard time figuring out where to start, and like at one point there were you know, 30 pages on Bertha's childhood and it made no sense. And I tried to, I tried a lot of different, I mean, it's also the thing about genealogy. The genealogy, it begins when you can't go back any further. Um, and, but if you're writing a third per, person omniscient story, you like technically, you should be able to go back as, as far as you want to. And so I solved that problem by having her suddenly appear. And I must have been thinking about Rip Van Winkle when I wrote it, because I certainly reread that story early on when I was, you know, there's not that much bowling literature and um, <laughs> I made sure I read it. Okay, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that, that that was the first time bowling appeared in literature, but yeah, that was like instantly what I thought of. So is, is there a backstory to her appearance in the cemetery or that's just, seemed like a fine place to start. Yeah, I feel, I mean, I, I feel like I, um, I knew at some point a lot about what her childhood had been like, um, but I'm not sure it makes any difference to the, to the book. I never, I don't think I ever decided how she showed up there exactly. Um, yeah, so I don't have an answer for that. I think part of it uh, that we had a lot of discussion around the sort of mythology or legend or even supernatural elements that are placed throughout the story. Um, we have monsters and prophetic dreams and 
Uh, and the fact that Bertha herself, you, you, you referred to her as the main character, uh, although she is only alive for first, I don't know, 20, 30 pages. Um, and then uh, her existence is very um, folklore in that she's sort of just born in the graveyard and she, at the time has no past. Um, so talk to us a little bit of, about that kind of, uh, there, there's a very, it seems to us at least, a folklore element, a lot of mythology throughout the, throughout the novel. Yeah, no, 100%. And so spontaneous combustion was already in there and some other aspects of sort of unexplained phenomena, because I was thinking of those, those books that I loved as a kid. And then as it happened, my son, Gus, who was 11 at the time, maybe 10, was reading his own version of one of these books. And he began to excitedly tell me about the Jersey Devil and then right. talked about, uh, and this I just totally ripped off, uh, <laughs> that people were in the early 20th century, or maybe it was the 19th century, offering rewards for people who brought in the Jersey Devil. And somebody did bring in a kangaroo painted green with an enormous set of false wings, which was also right. briefly, again, bad title for a novel, but briefly it was the title of the novel. <laughs> uh, a kangaroo with an enormous set of paint. <laughs> um, and when he started talking about it, all of a sudden I thought, oh yeah, I want, I would like to use all of that, all that sort of urban mythology. And for the book, and because I, I think that this was sort of the thrill that I got when I read those books, for the book to take no stance on whether those things are true or not. Um, in the book itself, nothing is presented as a, none of that, those strange things are presented as objectively having happened in the book. It, it's always people said, or they believe this, and including when Arch goes off in Cape Cod and thinks he sees a, oh, right. um, a UFO. The alien, um, yeah. Yeah, but I, it, was, it was because because I was, I really wanted to try to write something that was unnerving in the way that I loved being unnerved as a kid reading those books. But there's that blurring of the lines, right? Because same thing with the molasses flood. It seems like folklore. It just right. seems ridiculous. Um, but it's real. And, you know, supposedly a spontaneous question maybe is real, maybe not. So there is this sort of, you know, blurring of lines of what's folklore, what's real, what's not. Um, but I do want to touch again on, I don't want to harp on it too much, but the molasses flood in particular as a device is so fascinating to me because uh, as I mentioned, I think both pre previous sessions, molasses is funny, like as a, a substance, it's a funny stuff. Uh, it's been used in comedy a lot. And then here you have it in this most tragic and awful of settings. And I just felt like it, it is, a, a, I can see why you, <laughs> you know, we're anxious to use it for so long because it's such a, that tragedy is such a literary um, event. Yeah, I, and I think I might've read about it for the first, the, um, from the Boston area, for the first time in a list of improbable historic mm -hmm. events that included sort of those weird, um, like reigns of fishes, you know, that right. the, like the Arkansas meat shower all of those things that you don't know whether they happen or not but the molasses club you know a matter of historical you know it's record yeah yeah my first time reading through i didn't believe it was actually happened i was like okay it's going to end soon <laughs> yeah there's no there's no reason to believe that such a thing could ever happen in this world right right what what else do you guys have? Are there theories you want to make sure we cover or check in on? I know that uh, we talked also about uh, you didn't shy away from you know sensitive issues. There's interracial relationships, there's gender roles, there's sexuality. Um, and I, I think I really appreciate that, um, especially a, a novel that's you know re really somewhat recently. And it provided us with really meaningful discussion you know it, it was an enjoyable discussion but it really um it was meaningful and i just wanted to acknowledge that we really enjoyed those discussions 
And I think, I think the way that it was in there as well, like kind of normalized it in a way that's not done. It, it's, it's made a bigger part of, you know, a story sometimes and the kind of candid nature that you're just like, oh yeah, um, Joe Ware's gay. Like uh, mm -hmm. just kind of randomly, like finally clicked in my brain because it, it never said it like straight out. And I was like the, when his, his, uh, former lover also died in the molasses thing. I was like, who is this guy? And as the story kind of evolved, I was like, oh, he was, he was in love with them. And like, that made it even more tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's my so, favorite character, I think, in the book, Joe Ware. Yeah, he's great. I, might, I love him too. It might be, it, and it, it, it may be if something very, Stranger and I was writing him happened, which is, so I said, I, I had this long list of names and I began writing the book and I was calling him Jack Ware. And he, he was a very minor character in my first concept of the book. I, you know, I, I, was, I was using these names liberally and I couldn't get him right. And then I went back and looked at the genealogy and I realized the name I had meant to use was Joe Ware. And it was sort of magical almost, I mean, not magical, but when I got his name right, I understood him much better. And I sort of felt like, oh, he was never a Jack. That was sort of, that's mm. too, um, I don't know, matter of fact or something about him. There's something a little more doleful about somebody named Joe, I feel mm. like. And, and once he had his, the right name, I, I began to know him much, much better. So related to Joe, uh... I'd love to hear more about this doll and why the birth doll and like what could just happen as well. Or that was something I feel like we've talked about a lot in our conversations. Yeah, so there's also a, I see a, a question from Emily in the, the exact same question. Same one. So this is an this is a kind of embarrassing answer um, because. I, had to keep, I was trying to figure out some way to keep Bertha in the book, to have her presence be in the book because it, it felt sort of off kilter. I'd already finished the draft. It felt off kilter that she died and then wasn't, that it was just stories about her that I wanted her to be there in some way. And when I was falling asleep one night, I thought, oh, you, this is it. I'm gonna put this doll in the book. And then when I woke up, I realized the reason I had this theory is I'm married to another writer who's on the faculty at UT named Edward Carey, who, this is really embarrassing. We live with a giant wooden doll that he carved that's part of his novel, Little. And I realized I just, and it was, it was like, I was falling asleep at the time and I was like, that's it, that's my answer. So it wasn't, it wasn't a really gratuitous piece of thievery. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I then talked to him and I said, hey, would you, if I wrote this, could you read it and see whether you think, because every now and then we'll accidentally take something from the other person and sure. we'll say, hey, knock it off. Or we'll say, yeah, no, of course, you know, we can both write about this. But this was actually something that he came up with and he, and he, um, and he made the object. That's what, like, I live with a giant doll of a woman that has my hair because I had a haircut and she needed, she needed hair. So, um, which was the way that I told myself it was okay, because right. <laughs> that was my that was my contribution. It's like the only artistic collaboration we've ever done is I gave a doll some my own hair, um, but but I did like the notion because I I there used to be a lot more about making art and in an early draft of the book um, Leviticus Sprague was a fairly serious painter. Um, but I, I liked that notion of that I feel like he couldn't make, Leviticus can't make a version of Bertha because he loves her. Whereas Joe Ware, who has a different relationship with her, could make something that I guess had some of her essence. I'm not sure. Sorry, there's a police car going down the street. Um, but I like that. I like the sort of strangeness and maybe just the impossibility of duplicating a human being. 
was compelling to me too. Yeah. So the the novel opens trying to find describing birth in the cemetery. Her limbs were really nilly, even her skirt looked broken in two along a central axis, though it was merely divided for cycling. And then it ends with the doll on top of the pinball machine with the description, her skirt was split down the middle for cycling, her limbs were really nilly. So why, why bookend the novel in, in that way? Same, same what you just said, basically, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, in, it, in some ways, it really did feel like a structural book ending, like this is holding this thing together. Right. Um, and the beginning, I mentioned the beginning being very hard for me to get right, but the right. end was also very hard for me to get right. And at one point, it ended, gosh, who? Oh, it was with Margaret's funeral. I was about to say, there was a funeral. Whose funeral could it have been? <laughs> But it was Margaret's funeral, like everybody came back and it was just tremendously cheesy and didn't make any sense. They, they opened the safe and it felt so tidy and orchestrated. Um, and I realized I had to end sort of before and after it at the same time. And I liked that idea that there was this, all the stuff happens in the book and I kind of like the perverseness of going, but they're the same thing. The beginning and the ending are the, are the same thing. Gotcha. Again, maybe because it's sort of like a genealogy, in which case it really right. is. The beginning and the ending are, you know, people have families and they have children or they don't have children. And, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I also, I was happy to have Joe be sort of the, to have survived it. Yeah, so I wanted to mention Joe, and I want to mention the um, maybe one of you can talk about um, your impressions of Minna as well. Um, but for Joe, I think one of the reasons I, I liked him so much is because I misjudged him early on. <laughs> you know, I thought that he was a dunce. Like I thought that he was just a very sort of shallow, uh, maybe that's not the right word, um, sort of one dimensional kind of person. Uh, and then he just unfolded into this really fascinating character with, with who you know lived such a fascinating life. So I think that's the reason I I really like Joe, uh, and maybe uh, some of the same reasons why I really like Minna. But before we talk about those characters, I also want to talk about the alley as a character <clears throat> because that is uh, the. In, in the cent the central character, you know, it's the one thing that sustains the story is sustained throughout the story. So, uh, you know, we talked about Candlepin, but in terms of the alley itself, can you talk a little bit about, you know, your experience writing the alley and the, and the evolution or, you know, how, how that came to be? Yeah, um, and probably was the first it was the, the first character I knew of before I knew any of the characters with names that I, I knew. I knew I wanted to write something that was multi-generational, but that needed to have something at its center. And in fact, in earlier drafts, I left the alley for long periods of time and the book just didn't work when I did that. And the, one of the reasons why there isn't that much of Minna in the book is that there had been more, but the problem was she is a, and again, I don't mean to sound too mystical about my characters and go, well, she just wouldn't do this. I wanted her to do something, she wouldn't do it. But as a character, she does not want to be near the alley. It is right. a place of enormous unhappiness for her. Yeah. Um, and so a couple of times I like tried to write something that would bring her to the alley, but it felt false mm. because she just wasn't, as a human being, she was not motivated to be there. Um, and there was, it's funny to think about because I haven't thought about it for a long time. All of these different storylines, you know, there was a lot more about Roy and him going off to be far away from the alley. And again, it, the the book lost its tension when mm -hmm. it so there there are not that many scenes that, are, that occur outside of right. Salford and specifically from the alley for that reason. And I really did sort of there's that description early in the book of it sort of like in a cut in a cutaway sense. Or you can see the different um, oh yeah 
floors yeah. and and that it was sort of always in my head that way the sort of almost like a stage set in which mm-hmm. things happen and also i just loved what another thing that's just from research is that a lot of bowling alleys really did have a steel screen um to hide women bowling from the oh bowling. is that right wow yeah wow bizarre yeah <laughs> kind of on the same character development trying to understand your thought process why the um, breaking into other office buildings or professor offices. rooms or anything? Yeah, offices in general. <laughs> yeah, why why that process? <laughs> Probably was sitting in my office in Calhoun and going, yeah. fantasizing. Really quiet yeah. here. <laughs> what, what's going on in that office? Um, I feel like I should remember why I thought I wanted that. I just that there is that sort of sense of it's always interesting when when characters misbehave. Uh, particularly in a way that you, I would like to make clear, I've never broken into any of my colleagues' offices. <laughs> <laughs> so I always do like to, I always do when I walk down the hallways that people have their doors open, I always do peer in. Um, and I think sure. that there was something, again, in that sort of sense of like thinking of a building and, and thinking of it architecturally and all the strange things that are hope, happening in the places that you uh, can't see. I was probably thinking about that and thought, I'm just going to make a character who does that. And it seemed, it sort of seemed like something, just such a bad idea, but something that he might do because he's lonely. And he also, I do think um, somebody asked about whether uh, a draft where Nam dies in a crazy way. Um, and the answer is no. And it was partially because I was interested, you know, he's a terrible father, a terrible abusive father. Um, and I think, there's a way in which Roy as a character is just feral for the rest of his life um, because of the family he comes from. And that I think one of the reasons he breaks into offices is because nobody taught him that that is a terrible and dumb thing to do. And I did kind of want to have the weird threat of him through the book, um, which is why I didn't kill him in place. Even though I mean, he is that- just deserves it. <laughs> Is that kind of the same same uh, concept around when Arch was like stealing what, like silver pots, but like not the lids or the lids, it was the lids and not the pot or the pots and not the lids? I, I, home, I think it comes home with the lids and not the pots. I, that is, although it is also, um, I mentioned this in the acknowledgements because uh, that's the, that's the biggest scene that's away, you know, not in this, not in the United States. Um, uh, and a lot of the detail from that section is from this very strange memoir my aunt Jessica wrote. And Jess wrote in this, um, this memoir that she had done that. She had stolen just a bunch of stuff. And she, if you knew her in real life, very unlikely person to have done this but also wrote about it in a way that, I mean, I think it was just the idea that it was the enemy's stuff, you right. know, and that, <laughs> that it was all right, but that she also felt that she had been punished by the fact that she ended up with lids and no, and no bottoms. For, for me, I felt like it was just a self-destructive nature that Arch and Roy both have I think maybe a a few characters have that sort of self-destructive tendency, but um, it's like he couldn't help himself but to screw something up. (laughs) So um, I also want to make sure that we mentioned that this is not your latest book. You have a new book out called The Souvenir Museum. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Tell us what it's about. I'm going to put a link in the chat so people sure. can find it too. Um, it's a collection of short stories. Um, there are five stories in it that are about the same characters from periods throughout their life um, together. Uh, and there's a lot of, it's got a couple of Texas stories. There's a story that takes place in entire world 95% at Schlitterbahn, um, specifically the Schlitterbahn in Galveston, where I have been many, many times. <laughs> um, and then another story that takes place in various vintage shops in, in Austin. Those are not part of the connected 
stories, but there's a lot of travel in it. Um, and it's very, it was particularly strange because it came out um, in April of this year at a time, I'm now I'm in, in London, um, but at a time when it seemed like I'd accidentally written a book of science fiction because characters just got on planes and went anywhere they wanted to. Right, <laughs> how bizarre. <laughs> very, very strange behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I want to check to make sure people don't have uh, any other additional questions, but I do also want to make sure that I think Echo, uh, the publisher of Bowl Away, they've been a, a great partner and they provided us with a uh, hundred copies of the books that went out to people at UT and all those folks participated in smaller reading groups around campus. So thank you to Echo. They've been they've been great through all of this. With that, what other final questions do you have for our guest, Elizabeth McCracken? If I if I would have saw the name of the extraordinary deaths of ordinary people, I would absolutely have grabbed the book, <laughs> even if it didn't you know make sense in my brain after I read it for this book. Um, but I thought that was interesting because I didn't know you're mentioning like some books that had lists like that, and I remember. When I was growing up, there was a show called A Thousand Ways to Die, like on MTV or something. Oh, yeah, and it yeah. was a very similar thing. Like somebody's like they're playing lawn darts and this dude just gets like oh, a lawn God. dart in his head. Awful. And just like these crazy, like other stories like that. And I, think it's I, had, I have a friend who wrote a play called Lawn Dart about that kid who got hit in the head with a lawn dart. Oh, wow. And it... <laughs> There was a band called Ed's Redeeming Qualities in, from Boston that had a song called Lawn Dart about that. <laughs> but it is, that's the thing is, is that those weird deaths really, they resonate with you. Canavis, yeah. yeah. Brianna, any last questions, comments? No, I just want to thank Elizabeth for just sharing your insights about the book. That was very enlightening really thank you for that yeah my my play i can i say i'm so when when i was told that the book was was chosen i was so tickled and delighted because i know it's like not a book for everybody it's a very particular and odd book and in some ways it's the book that i wrote when i thought i'm just going to put any old thing in this book that i want to. <laughs> like, i'm not yeah. going to think about what interests other yeah. people i'm right. going to i mean you always do that to some extent, but I thought, I really, it's kind of, this is the book I write that's gonna be crammed full of everything that's bothered me. And that I know that for some people, um, you know, they start to read it and they go, oh, this is not, this is not my kind of book. Mm. So I particularly, I really, I, I really appreciate that it was chosen because it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly eccentric, not everybody's cup of tea kind of, kind of novel. Who wants to talk about a book that's for everyone? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that's what made it so fun is to talk about as a group. It's kind of the yes. quirkiness of it. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. yeah, it was so surprising. It had it really inspired some some fun discussion uh, amongst all of us and you know through the smaller re reading groups through campus. So I I just loved it and I'm I'm so grateful that you joined us for this final session. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you so much and thank Thank you, everybody. The the you, everybody on the panel and 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 otherwise. Somebody did ask, do you use a computer oh. or a typewriter? Oh, I missed that one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or a pen and paper. Or a I, pen and paper. I mostly use a computer. My students can attest to the fact that my handwriting is illegible to everybody, including myself. So I can take a few notes. I actually do in my office have a giant old IBM Selectric um, that I got maybe a couple of weeks after we moved to Austin um, from Craigslist. And I, I, I type on that a little bit because it's, it's somehow feels different to, oh, it feels like sure. operating a piece of heavy machinery. Yeah. Um, and that seems to change the way I think. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. I hope that we are paths, paths cross again sometime soon. I hope we look so forward too. to reading your next book too. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you very much, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.